Hello and welcome to the last of these videos that I've been doing to accompany the sermon series on Paul's letters from prison where we've looked so far at Philippians and then Colossians and finally in this video we're going to be looking at Paul's shortest letter, the letter to Philemon. My name is Ed Kinneen and I work for the Baptist College here in Cardiff and I'm also a member of uh, Ararat Baptist Church in North Cardiff and I'm really grateful to those of you who have taken the trouble to get in touch and to uh, express appreciation for these videos. I'm glad that they've been helpful to some people at least but even if not I've enjoyed putting them together. And when we come to Philemon, well, it's not the kind of letter that you normally hear preached on. So it's good that we're taking a bit of time to look at it. And unlike the other letters, which might take you, I don't know, half an hour or so to read, uh, this letter will literally only take you a couple of minutes. So if you haven't read it for a while, or maybe you've never read it before, then uh, go and find a Bible and uh, open it up to Philemon and read it now and then it'll make more sense what we're going to say after this. So, just like the other letters, we find that the letter to Philemon comes directly from Paul, as we might expect, who describes himself as a prisoner, hence it's a letter written from prison, and it also comes from Timothy, and so we're reminded that uh, Paul's letters were not simply, as it were, his, his own invention, but they so, say something about the mission team that he was a part of. And it was written to Philemon uh, and to Apphia, who is probably his wife, and to Archippus, who is probably his son, and notice it's written to the church in your house. So uh, to a large extent this is a personal letter, it's written from Paul to Philemon, but the fact that it's written to the church in Philemon's house suggests that perhaps there was a wider audience intended for its message as well. And we've said before that Paul's letters were typically written not actually by Paul, because who knows whether he could uh, write or not, uh, but rather they would have been written by a scribe. Uh, could be that in this case it's maybe Timothy who has written it down for him. But here in uh, verse 19 of Philemon, we get Paul uh, expressing his commitment to pay back any money to Philemon that might be owed, and he, uh, as it were, guarantees that by writing his uh, own commitment here in his own hand. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. But what we find in this letter, unlike all of Paul's other letters, is no evidence of where it is written to. So normally Paul will say to the church in Rome or to the church in Colossae, but here no location is given and so we're, we're left trying to kind of guess. But there is a close relationship between the list of names that we find in this letter to Philemon and the list of names that we find in the letter to the Colossians. So uh, to take the people who are with Paul, described as being with Paul in Colossians, well we have Timothy and Epaphras and Mark and Justus and Aristarchus, Demas and Luke. And the people who are described as being with Paul because they send greetings uh, in the letter to Philemon, well, we've got Timothy and Epaphras and Mark and Aristarchus and Demas and Luke. Uh, in other words, the only person who's not mentioned is Justus, and maybe Justus wasn't known uh, by Philemon and his church, but all of the other people are together with Paul. And so it would seem likely... Uh, given the number of people who are all together at this point, that Paul was writing these two letters at the same time and from the same place. And then we notice uh, in Colossians the people who are travelling from Paul, in other words bringing the letter from Paul to the Colossians, uh, was Tychicus and Onesimus. And in Philemon, the person who is mentioned as travelling from Paul is Onesimus. So in other words, it may well be that Anesimus is uh, bringing along with Tychicus a letter to uh, the church in Colossae and then bringing another letter from Paul to Philemon. Uh, 
And then the people to whom Paul is writing, well, mentioned in Colossians are Nympha and Archippus, and mentioned in the letter to Philemon are Philemon and Apphia, and again, Archippus. So it looks like there is some connection between the church in Colossae and the church uh, that meets in Philemon's house. However, Philemon and Apphia are not a part of the Colossian, the, the Colossian church. And so perhaps this is a separate church, but maybe not very far away because Archippus is mentioned in both of them. Now, in the letter to the Colossians, it says, Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea, says Paul, and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you read also the letter from Laodicea. I wonder, therefore, whether this letter to Philemon is the letter that Paul is talking about, the letter of the Laodiceans here. And you might remember from our video on Colossians that uh, Colossae and Laodicea are not very far from each other. And if we zoom in a bit into this area called the Lycus uh, Valley, then you can see that Colossae and Laodicea are really not far apart at all. So it would seem reasonable that we've got uh, two letters being written, if you like, to two sister churches, but they're not exactly in the same place. It's not just one church, but they are two nearby churches where uh, many of the people are known from one church to the other. And as we saw last time, there's not much left of Colossae, really, but actually uh, Laodicea is a much more impressive place. And perhaps, and this is very much a perhaps, perhaps that would be in line with uh, a man like Philemon who has a church in his house and has at least one, but almost certainly many more slaves. So what is this letter about? Well, really, it's about how do you solve a problem like Onesimus? Because Onesimus, according to verse 16 of this letter, is Philemon's slave. And the background to the letter is that uh, Onesimus has ended up with Paul, wherever Paul is. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. But the question is, why is Onesimus with Paul? Well, the traditional explanation is that Onesimus has uh, stolen money or something else from his uh, owner, Philemon, and is therefore on the run. And having been on the run, he has ended up with Paul. Amazing. If that is the case, then where is Paul? Well, you may remember from uh, last time that the traditional explanation from, uh, for where Paul is when he's writing uh, Colossians and uh, Philemon as well, therefore, is Rome. But then people start to question if Onesimus is a runaway slave, how on earth has he ended up getting all the way from Laodicea to Rome? And more to the point, even if he's gone all of that way, how has he ended up bumping into Paul? That seems just too much of a coincidence, really. And so some people have therefore proposed that, in fact, Paul might be in Ephesus. Uh, and it, it is possible, uh, if we go back to our uh, first video, it is possible that Paul was in prison in Ephesus, although we have no absolute evidence from the Bible uh, about this. It, simply, it's obviously much nearer, and so it's more likely that uh, Onesimus might be able to run away to Ephesus in order to happen to bump into Paul. But there is another possibility, which is that Onesimus has deliberately gone to Paul. Maybe he has met Paul. Uh, let's say Paul has been to the church, which would make sense uh, because Paul greets people in the church. Um, and maybe Onesimus has met him there, considers him to be a good man, 
and somebody who could be an advocate for him, perhaps if he has already done wrong. Maybe he's looking to Paul to be a kind of go-between, uh, to, to placate Philemon. Uh, and that's possible, and that would give uh, more, I think, uh, credence to the idea that uh, Onesimus might have gone all the way to Rome uh, in order to meet up with Paul. But there is yet another explanation which says, well, actually, the evidence that Onesimus has really done anything wrong is, is quite slim. Uh, Paul may just be uh, guessing that there might be some issues or some friction between Onesimus and Philemon. And perhaps Onesimus has been deliberately sent either by Philemon or by the church in Colossae to go and uh, see how Paul is doing, to give him some help while Paul is in prison. And if that's the case, well, Paul might well be in Rome. Uh, indeed, in the letter to the Colossians, we see Tychicus is coming with Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. And there we do get a suggestion that perhaps Onesimus is um, at least in some sense part of the church and is therefore used to being used uh, to serve the church. So there are different possibilities for why it is that uh, Onesimus might have ended up with Paul, whether Paul's in Ephesus or, in my view, just um, possibly in Rome itself. So we don't really know why Onesimus is with Paul. We're also not too sure what it is that Paul really wants Philemon to do. So it's clear in verse 16 that Paul wants Philemon to receive Onesimus back as a brother. That's the language that he uses. But what does that actually mean? In particular, does Paul expect Philemon to set Onesimus free so that he would no longer be a slave? Or is it rather that Paul expects Philemon maybe to treat Onesimus better, to treat him as he would a brother, even though Onesimus would continue to be a slave within his household? One thing that's just worth noting is how Paul makes his appeal in this letter. Paul, I think we could all agree, is probably quite a good arguer. But in this letter, it's as if he plays a good cop and a bad cop role. And we can see that he alternates from one to the other as he tries to persuade Philemon to go along with what Paul wants. So he starts off to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. So, you know, buttering him up, really. And then he says, oh, and to the church that meets in your home. In other words, it would be uh, easy for Philemon to ignore the letter if it was only written to him. Much harder if this is a letter that's being read out in front of uh, his whole church. Then says Paul, well, I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. What a great Christian you are. Well, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. I could be, says Paul. But I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Well, it's as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner, that I'm writing this. I didn't want to do anything without your consent. Well, if you consider me a partner, and jolly well should do, of course, well, I will pay it back. But just let me remind you that you owe me your very self. Um, refresh my heart in Christ, uh, confident of your obedience. You will do even more than I ask. And he finishes off by saying, prepare a guest room for me. In other words, I'm coming round to make sure that you've done what I'm asking you to do. So Paul very cleverly, I think, uh, puts together a, a, a persuasive argument here that's based on both carrot and stick to get Philemon to respond as Paul wants him to respond regarding Onesimus's future. So let's talk about slavery. And in particular, we should note a particular feature in the Bible, or in the English Bibles, I should say. So we're used to the language of servanthood 
So here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight, Isaiah. I am the servant of the Lord, uh, says Mary uh, at the start of Luke's gospel. No servant can serve two masters, says Jesus. We're also used to the language of slaves. So in the law, in the Old Testament, if a man beats his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished. Or Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Or Paul says in Galatians, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And so we might well think that there is this clear distinction between on the one hand servants and on the other hand slaves. But actually, our English versions are misleading us here, because all of these words translated servant here, actually, the word is slave. And so there is no difference between the words used in the uh, servant's column here and the words used in the slave's column. And this is important because we can easily be misled in our thinking about what it is we're talking about here. Because the problem with the language of servanthood is that it makes us think of something like Downton Abbey. And the kind of people who appear in Downton Abbey and they uh, are serving the family. Now, I'm sure that many of the people who were in service had a pretty bad experience. But nevertheless, it was a job. And uh, if they wanted to, they could leave that job. They were paid for doing this job and there were, uh, I guess, the possibilities of advancement. This is not the case for slaves. Slaves were owned and they uh, were not paid for doing the job. They were just expected to be at the beck and call of the family. Nevertheless, when we're talking about slavery in the ancient world, we're not talking about the same kind of slavery as we saw in the transatlantic slave trade. And the main difference, I mean, I, I suspect the, the experience was not dissimilar, but the main difference is that slavery in the ancient world was not particularly based on, on race. And so what was it like to be a slave? Well, how did you become a slave for a start? There were a number of different options. Uh, one of the most common was reproduction. The, the children who were born to slaves belonged to the owner. And one of the terrible threats for uh, slaves was that they might be either set free or sold on without their children. And so that was a way of controlling uh, parents who were slaves. Then there were foundlings. Uh, what this means is um, if you were a poor family and you thought that you wouldn't be able to bring up the, the baby that you just had, then uh, there, were, there were places in uh, a city where you could leave that child. Uh, it was kind of like an ancient form of abortion, really. Um, and uh, that child might either die or might be picked up by a slave trader and they would be uh, fed and nurtured as a, as a baby, and then as they were a little bit older, they would be sold uh, into slavery, and that's how the slave trader would recoup the cost that they'd had to spend on, on bringing the child up. Um, sometimes children were sold into slavery by parents. Sometimes adults sold themselves into slavery. But I think, uh, certainly judging by sermons I've heard over the years, uh, I think that there is perhaps a perception within uh, Christian preachers that this was common, that slavery was better than being poor, but that this simply wasn't the case and it was very uncommon for this to happen. Um, a person could be enslaved as a punishment for crime. Uh, there was piracy across the Mediterranean and uh, people were captured as slaves, which would be the closest to the transatlantic slave trade. And then um, some of the, the, the most common ways in which people became slaves were prisoners of war. And um, in fact, one of the arguments for why the Roman Empire expanded at the rate that it did is because it had to keep expanding in order to take people as slaves uh, because they needed uh, slaves were so essential to the economy uh, and industry of the Roman Empire, especially Roman Italy. 
And so the, the most common, probably, uh, sources of slaves were reproduction and uh, these foundlings, uh, babies who, who were left to die, uh, or prisoners of war. And you can see why one of the descriptions of slavery, therefore, in the ancient world was that slavery is equivalent to death, to dying. Because, for example, if the Roman army comes and invades your country and uh, defeats you, the expected um, repercussions are that the defending army will be killed. So, instead of them being killed, they are taken into slavery. So slavery, therefore, is equivalent to dying. And that must have affected both how slave owners saw their slaves as well as how slaves saw themselves. In terms of buying a slave, well, you would go down to uh, the local slave market to buy a slave. And slaves would be stood up on, on plinths and you would uh, go and look closely at them, you would prod them, uh, you would perhaps talk to them, uh, because uh, the slave market was kind of equivalent to, forgive me for saying so, if anybody is a used car dealer, but is a little bit like the equivalent of second-hand car salesmen, um, and they had a reputation for being uh, dodgy. So, for example, they would uh, use det depilatories to um, remove any any hair from the body of a slave to make them look younger because the younger the slave the more valuable they were um, they would um, give them uh, sort of chemicals to drink that would slow the signs of puberty for the same same kind of reason in terms of owning slaves well there were different ideas about this but one of the most uh, common and dramatic uh, expressions of ancient thinking comes from Aristotle, who, talking about uh, work on the farm, describes a slave as a piece of animate property. So in the same way as you would have a plough to help you to do the work on the farm, so you'd have a slave to help you to do the work on the farm. And the slave, in just the same way as the plough, is a piece of property. And so there is an argument for looking after it, but of course you also get rid of it and treat it how you, how, however you wish. Slaves would be named when they come into the family, and I'll say more about this in the, the sermon uh, on this book. But they would be given a name that would express kind of the owner's wishes. So um, slaves were often named Eros, love, or uh, Fides, faithful. Uh, Felix, lucky. And so uh, the slave's own name is taken away from them and the identity of the owner is put onto the slave when they're brought into uh, the household. Uh, it was really not uncommon to uh, own slaves. So many people uh, owned three slaves, um, whether they lived in the countryside or whether they lived uh, in the city. But the wealthiest people owned an extraordinarily ridiculous number of slaves. Um, and the slaves would do all sorts of work. If you Basically, if you could imagine any task, a slave could or would do it. And so uh, in some ancient lists, the slaves are described as water carriers, um, clothes menders, painters, bakers. Uh, there is even, uh, these are fairly menial tasks, I suppose, um, but there were also slaves who were business agents. There was even a slave who was in charge of the treasury of Gaul. So uh, slaves could do literally any sort of role, but whatever their role, they were still under the ownership of uh, a slave master. Slaves, especially younger slaves, both men and women, would be used as sexual objects. This kind of sex was almost considered acceptable. Um, slaves who disobeyed, uh, they would be punished with violence, sometimes uh, absolutely terribly. And I think violence to their person was a common experience of being a slave. Um, Marshall was uh, an ancient writer, and Romans found his writing very funny. You may not find it quite so funny, but here is one of his epigrams. He says, writing to his friend, I appear to you cruel and over-gluttonous because, on account of the dinner, Rusticus, I lash my cook. Uh, 
If that seems to you a slight reason for a beating, for what reason then do you wish a cook to be flogged? Notice here that the shocking element of this is not meant to be that the cook is being flogged. Uh, rather, it's for what reason might it happen? And um, the film Spartacus was on the television again recently, and you may remember if you've seen that film, the uh, line of slaves being crucified. And this was uh, a punishment that was particularly um, common for slaves, which is why in Philippians chapter 2 we saw that Jesus dying upon the cross, having taken the form of a slave, actually that has resonances because crucifixion was a common punishment for slaves. And as we've already said, children who were born to slaves belonged to the owner. And as you get older, you might be set free. Now, on the face of it, that sounds like a good thing and something to look forward to. However, in actual fact, the, uh, it, there was an economic benefit to the slave owner because essentially once the slave could no longer do the kind of work that you wanted them to do, um, maybe, frankly, as we get older, you know, we might need a bit of looking after and support. If you set the, fr the slave free, you no longer had any responsibility for them. You didn't have to pay out the money needed to look after them. So it's an economic decision to set slaves free as they got older. Bottom line, being a slave was a bad thing. Nobody wanted to be a slave. And when we read slavery in the New Testament, or indeed the Bible as a whole, we should have this kind of image in our mind of something that is terrible, because it was terrible. And so a question that is asked is, was Christianity good or bad for slaves? And a famous answer to that question, written by a, a scholar of ancient history, is this. It is often said that Christianity introduced an entirely new and better attitude towards slavery. Nothing could be more false. Those are challenging words. And it's a bit unfair, but equally we have to be honest and say that there is nothing in the Bible that insists on slaves being set free or on slavery as an institution being eradicated. Indeed, many of the significant figures in the Old Testament, especially we think of the likes of Abraham, they are described as significant men because of the number of slaves that they owned. It was a sign of their wealth and uh, indeed supposedly a sign of their blessing by God. And in the New Testament, slavery is simply assumed. Uh, and those slaves are addressed in the letters, which is in and of itself a pretty amazing thing because clearly they're hearing the same instructions as their owners. On the whole, they are being told to put up with being slaves and to be obedient as slaves. Slave owners, they are accepted as part of the church and they are told to be not too cruel to their slaves, but to be wise stewards. There isn't any suggestion that they should get rid of their slaves. And even Paul's famous statement in Galatians, which I'm going to say more about in my sermon uh, on Philemon. Even in this amazing passage, well, Paul may be saying that it doesn't really matter, in a sense, to God if you're Jewish or Gentile or slave or a free person or a man or a woman. Um, he's not actually getting rid of slaves uh, any more than he's getting rid of men and women. So... There is quite a lot that might make us as Christians feel rather uncomfortable. But to some extent, what do we expect? I mean, even if the Christians, the first Christians could imagine a world without slavery, there wasn't much they could do about it. But there are some positives. So we note that slaves were part of the church and they could become leaders of the church. Uh, the list of names at the, in the final chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 16, 
Uh, the vast majority of those people who are probably leaders of small groups in the Roman church, uh, the vast majority are slave names. And so perhaps uh, the first churches were made up by a significant number of slaves or former slaves. Then there were some Christians who thought it was important to free slaves. So in the first letter uh, of Clement, um, written in the early part of the second century, we know, he says, that many among ourselves have had themselves imprisoned so that they might ransom others. Many have sold themselves into slavery and with the price received for themselves have fed others. I mean, that's extraordinary. So, in other words, they are trying to raise money by putting themselves into slavery. And with that money, they are ransoming others. In other words, buying people out of slavery. And they are also feeding others. We don't know how common this was. And of course, there were still slave owners in the church. But nevertheless, this kind of evidence shows that there were some Christians who felt that slavery was not what God intended. And then, of course... All of the Christian beliefs were shaped by an understanding of Christ being uh, like a slave. And so my hope is that because Christ could be regarded uh, as a slave, therefore in the same way these slaves, even though they weren't necessarily set free, nevertheless felt that um, because of who they'd been made to be, they actually mattered to God in a way they'd never realised before. So we come to one final question. And the question is simple. What on earth is the letter to Philemon doing in the New Testament? I mean, in Philippians, we've had that amazing Christ hymn and all the encouragement in there. You can see why that would be it. We've had Colossians and the extraordinary statements about Christ. Uh, in chapter one, for example, you can see why that would be in there. But the letter to Philemon? I mean, there's no theology in it. And that's why uh, many scholars have simply ignored Fly Lehman up until uh, very recent times. I like to think that the reason why Fly Lehman is in the New Testament is because those who put the New Testament together, they didn't just see, as some scholars have said, a connection with Colossians. They didn't just see, well, this is a letter from Paul, therefore it's important. But actually they felt it mattered how the church related on issues of slavery. I think that is key. But there's something more. And this is um, a, a mural in Belgrade, in the uh, cathedral, I think, there. And what it says is Apostle Anisimus, Messenger Anisimus. There is a very interesting statement in a letter by Ignatius in the second century to the Ephesians. He says there, In God's name, therefore, I received your large congregation in the person of Anisimus, your bishop in this world, a man whose love is beyond words. My prayer is that you should love him in the spirit of Jesus Christ and all be like him. Blessed is he who let you have such a bishop. You deserved it. Tradition has it that this bishop Anisimus was former slave Anisimus. And I love that idea. And if it's right, then wouldn't it give us an amazing insight into Paul's words in the letter to Philemon? Perhaps this is the reason Onesimus was separated from you, Philemon, for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.